So today I wanted to uh, speak some about testing, and this is going to be an area that's going to follow us broadly through a bunch of the course. If, of course, we can talk about QA processes more generally, uh, particularly with the emphasis on peer review. Um, but a big part of this course is really hammering home a lot of issues um, that that are more nitty gritty issues with testing and its relationship to things like specification. Um, and we're going to be starting to really get into some of those issues uh, today and continuing on with various ones. Some of those are going to involve um, in class exercises. Um, others will involve uh, take home exercises. Uh, all will involve work on your projects. Um, but but some additional uh, lectures. So I want to make you know comments on the testing front. I think I've already emphasized what's expected of you in this area. You know, design for testability, the use of test matrices, these two axes, right? Tests and and features or requirements along the other axis. Many of you have created matrices with other information. That's great, separate from these, but those are the at least the basic ones I want. Um, they can be separated out. And the use of the V model of testing. Who remembers what's at the bottom of the V model of testing? Anyone? Uh, so not, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on non Waleed and I get a promoter to come on. <laughs> Love the lady ring. Uh, I think it's unit testing. Uh, yeah, that's right. The lowest levels are unit testing. And wh what are some higher level uh, levels of testing as you go up. Anyone? Uh, integration. Well, uh, so Juan. Integration testing. Uh -huh. and testing. Good. Acceptance testing is up at the top level, and and there are some uh, there are some intermediate levels that are sometimes emphasized and, and sometimes not. You have unit integration testing, where strictly speaking, unit testing might be testing each thing truly in isolation. Um, even though it calls off to other things, for example, or is called by other things, you want to test it in isolation. How would you do that? Imagine it calls off to other things to do its job. How would you possibly test it in isolation without testing everything it calls? Yes, Tony. Uh, you, mock. you mock. You use mocking. So you mock out the things it calls. And so those are basically faked out. And and then you could test this one in isolation. Now, sometimes that's done before the other things are implemented, and it allows you to still test this one. Other times, the other things are implemented, but you just want to have a really clear view of and be able to test, you know, be able to evaluate, is it calling the other things properly? Maybe there's one thing that's the initialization routine it calls off to, and you want to make sure it's only invoked once, for example. Or you want to make sure other things are never called with null arguments, uh, et cetera. And you can specify predicates with the mocking. Uh, so unit testing in its strictest form could be really one thing in isolation. Unit integration testing would be that thing and that couple of things that calls off to, you know, really genuinely calling off to the implemented versions. That, then integration tests would really focus on how it how two things play together, how they they work together. Tell me this, especially those system scientists in, in, in the mix. Um, with integration, is it is it possible when, when we think about integration tests, there could be two things, each tested really, really well in isolation. You know, passed all their unit tests. Uh, uh, they've been implemented according to, you know, their, their design. Uh, for each of them in isolation. Is it possible that you put them together and they might not work together? They might not work together properly? Yeah, why, why could that be? So Kamal is, is shaking his head. Uh, it's because like, there, there's a misunderstanding about how we want the pieces to work together. Um, yeah. So like one one piece could be like the billion positive integer. Yeah. So well, one piece might be expecting a positive integer, and the other piece is maybe just some could be negative number. 
It's not an issue on this That's side. Right. It is yeah, and, and for those who have been around Linux enough or you know Unix, uh, and POSIX uh, specifications or and in, in low level C code, you may know that there's this old tradition and sometimes a conflict as to whether for return value that's returned that says success. Does one mean success or does one mean failure? Zero is success, right? Um, just an interpretation, a different interpretation of what one and zero could mean could be perfectly reasonable for each in its own. One lives by this convention, one lives for that convention, what zero means or what one means. They're each solid implementations for their own conventions, but they don't work together well. The whole is broken, right? There's other cases where things fall through the cracks. One person assumes the other one will handle this case, awkward case. The other one assumes the other one will, right? Or they could have duplicated functionality where you know both of them, um, one closes the file after being, you know, A calls, calls B, B closes the file after it's done with it. And then A also closes this file thinking B hasn't closed it, right? Um, it, because it's not specified um, who closes it. So integration tests can reveal problems that fall through the cracks with when things are used together. And it really focuses how is A playing with B? How are they, you know, interacting? Um, are they playing nicely together? Are they successfully implementing their shared responsibilities, the ways in which they interact? And then there's system tests, which are testing broader functionality in the system, you know, like whole use cases or user stories, um, you know, steps that a, a user might go through that are meaningful at the user level and involves all sorts of function calls. So on. All sorts of classes playing together to deliver on them, right? Open up a document, print it out, edit it, print it again, and close it, or something like that. I and mean, that that could be a whole test to make sure that it's it's working properly. And then acceptance tests might be system tests at the highest level that are verifying key functionality. So a lot of a lot of suggestions. Many of these have been imparted before from this floor. Um, uh, you know, use of like GitHub issues for for this term, right? For for tracking. What? Why use GitHub issues? So last last term or two, we in three seventy one, we had a team using Discord. They said, "Well, we don't we don't need to use an issue tracking system. We'll just use Discord and say like, hey, I found a you know I, I found this failure. Could you go check it out? And you know." People would would trace. So, what what's an advantage of using GitHub issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of you can see if you have some sort of it's kind of more individual who can actually see what's going on. Because in the Discord chat, mm -hmm. that's what they can do. Yeah. Uh, someone may maybe go after and put something here, and you might forget about it because the issue is gone. But in the issues, it's all in. The yeah. So part of the thing is good, good, good. Um. Part of the issues is like GitHub issues might stay in front of you and, and the stuff in the Discord winner might scroll away, right? And, and be in the past. So that, that much is, is true. Yep, that, that's good reasons. But but there are other reasons too, having to do with things like interlinking and so on. So Abby, yeah. Yeah, and some teams, I, I think uh, team three, memory serves me, has done a really nice job of like, I think there are 20 label types for these issues, right? And um, and you can keep track of their status, right? Is it is it open? Has it been verified yet? Is, has it had been fixed yet nominally? Has it been confirmed as fixed and closed, um, for example? Uh, what else can you do in terms of sort of identifying its relationship to other things in the repo or other versions? Yes, yes. Um, it allows, like, Eric. I know this. Eric with that. Eric yeah. plus that. Uh, like, it allows you to even specify, like, a specific branch that is. Right. Right, right. It could, it could be for a particular branch. It could also be fixed by a particular commit, for example, right? Um, or it could have appeared in a certain commit, right? Um, so you say this one was resolved by this this commit to to fix it. 
that's really, really powerful um, to be able to refer to other things in the repo relevant to it by like commit ID, et cetera. You see what I mean? Or maybe it only came about as of this tag version of the system, for example. Um, so being able to have it in the repo lets you sort of cross-reference other things of relevance, right? Um, so um, all this is 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 important. Um, build for testability, I've, I've emphasized here. Um, debug for defect, uh, for debug your process, not just defects. Um, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by debug, debug your development process? Anyone? Yeah. Um, uh, 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 is this Matthew? No, it's Jesse who's moved into Matthew's spot. Okay, okay. I think Matthew may be online. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you figure good. You figure out what left you, what what problem with the process in terms of misunderstandings, not understanding the technology well enough, not dealing with merge conflicts quite well, uh, left you you know originated the problem, right? Um, uh, maybe it's a copy paste error, right? From from earlier code, um, not checked. But then you can also ask what allowed it to go unnoticed in law? Why didn't the pull request find it before it was merged into main, right? Um, what What is it about our test suite that let it through? If you can, if you can start to get insights with that, this mistake, this failure that's found by the test can become a success for the development process by learning, right? How to do things better, how to make our merge request, you know, work, work better, how to, how to get in place better testing suite, um, how to do more effective code reviews. Maybe it was in code that was reviewed, but somehow not found. What can we do to have, have code reviews that would find that sort of issue? And how can we learn from that issue more generally and find other similar, similar types of bugs in our review of the code base, right? Um, you can learn a lot from one bug if you think about where it came from, its life cycle, where it came from, why it was missed at several points by QA processes, um, what other things there are like it that might be in the code base, et cetera, or the one. Uh, one thing I like figure some of them that if you, you can actually find, uh, you can actually ask questions why some of this stuff are working that are not necessarily working. Yes, yes. So maybe that, that that's, that's, that's a good point. So like, um, the, the certain thing shouldn't be working in the fact that right yet, right? Part of, does anyone know what the steps of test-driven development? Yes, name again? Marcus. Marcus. Yes, good. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, good, Daniel, yeah. That, good man, Um. yes, Daniel. That they did not pass the tests in the okay. And should the code uh, originally be passing the tests? No, right? It, it shouldn't. Generally, if the tests are testing something meaningful before the code is written, um, really meaningfully started, they shouldn't pass those tests, right? The test should be testing something that requires code normally. And so when you start out, generally the tests would fail. If the tests are originally working, there's something kind of fishy about those tests, right? Um, so so often when we start out, we verify the tests, which are written test-driven development, we write the test first, those tests should fail. And then we put in place an implementation that should end up passing the tests and then, so we we make it right, and it, or we we make it run, and then we make it right, right? That that we actually refactor it and and polish it up and and improve the quality and the documentation, et cetera, um, um, and and uh, 
you know, complete it. So make the test, make it run, make it right, right? That, that's the kind of classic um, uh, sort of uh, chestnut for it. Yes, sir. So like for our project, we have a bunch of um, protections on parameters and stuff where if tests are failing, you can't merge. Right, so right. How would you make the test that fail and then? Well, you, 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 you don't want to merge it until the tests all, all work. Right. So you're saying like if someone makes a branch for a feature, they would just write their unit tests and then do that. Right. They're writing the unit tests uh, often before the code, and then they're writing the unit. And originally, the unit test should fail, and then then they they'll write the code in this branch, you know, for this, and and only after that's uh, successfully running those tests should even be a candidate for checking in. Hopefully, they do some they do some further refactoring on it. So that's not you're not writing tests out there for the actual system. No, no, no. Um, uh, I mean, you you could in principle put in place some tests that won't work for the at the whole system level. Um, it's not a totally crazy idea, but that those would have to be different tests than run during the CI, right? Uh, um, because the CI pipeline will often have a subset of tests. It won't run. This is a question that came up recently with test um, uh, test performance, because certain types of tests are very very expensive time wise. What what sort of test of the type types we've talked about? What sort might have you know significant sort of amount of time needed to run them? Anyone? Yes, one. And particularly system testing that's through the what. UI, yeah. So if you have UI scripting going on with Playwright or, or with you know Selenium, uh, or Cypress or UI testing at the at the app level for cross platform development, maybe through an emulator, that can be quite expensive, um, time wise. And often there are tests that are not part of the CI suite that run separately. Uh, you know, for evaluation purposes, but they won't block the, they, they won't block merges, et cetera. Um, okay, um, make sure you test, check the test errors. We've, we've spoken about that before. Uh, consider risk and, you know, putting effort into tests that are more likely to to find serious, uh, serious, you know, high severity problems. We'll, we'll talk about severity and priority in a bit. Um, Maybe not today, but maybe. Um, and uh, you should consider um, buddy testing, where uh, you know one developer writes tests for another developer's specification before B begins coding, and then B does the same for A. And so the person who writes the test is a different person than writes the code. Why would you do that? Why, why would you have different people? Yes, a uh, name, Cameron. Somebody. Like developer A, for example, might think of tests before developer B that they don't think of themselves. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Too often as developers, we write sympathetic tests. What do I mean by that? Sympathetic tests. Uh, yes, Cameron. We write tests that we know will pass. Yeah, we're, we, we kind of want to prove our code works, right? <laughs> and um, it's understandable psychologically. Want to show people, hey, you know, I put out some good code, right? But the problem is, if we take responsibility for both the tests and the code, we may be in the process overlooking, you know, problems with our ways of thinking. And those problems may manifest in the test assumptions and the code assumptions. We just have a consistent misunderstanding of what the code has to do. We forget the code has to handle certain awkward cases, right? Yeah. So, so uh, testing sympathetically can lead to testing too narrowly, right? Um, so you have better sort of objectivity, um, better cross checks on the assumption the person who writes the code is more likely to make if if they've omitted certain understanding they've. They haven't captured some of the understanding, haven't, haven't gotten that when they write the code. At least the tester will be more likely to know, you know, to, to have a broader understanding of the, the needs and to test it more completely. Um, 
So they're more likely to, to find defects in the code. This is break code, but it's find, find defects in the code, to find failures that indicate that. Right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think um, this spreads knowledge as well, right? What, why would it spread knowledge if you have different people working on the test versus the actual code for it? Yeah, because I have to explain to them what, how you think your code is working and also like, how you start to test with it because they have a knowledge of it and they don't want to do that's right. That's the and help you to debug what that's the, right. Often the people who write the um specification. So if developer A writes test cases for B specification, both of them need to know how this, you know, what this code has to do, right? I mean, so if A is writing the test cases against, as we say, B specification, testing it according to B specification. They're both thinking through how does this, how it, what is this code supposed to do? A may not know all the details of how B is going to um, uh, code up that, you know, code up that, um, that area of the code, but they know what it's supposed to do. So it does spread knowledge, uh, spread knowledge around, and it actually gets it tested more aggressively. Um, and it can be, very effective to test uh, for, for for testing. So, buddy testing, uh, pair testing, um, where where you know people are working next to each other for for testing, developing ideas for testing the code together. Um, bug parties are something we strongly recommend in this class, and they often find lots of defects, and they can be used to estimate the number of undiagnosed defects, as we'll see which is, is, is a really uh, fun thing to do. And hallway usability tests, which are a type of test on, on usability. Um, okay, um, right. Um, so here with bug parties, the idea is to do ad hoc testing interactively often and find bugs, improve coverage of the tests, you know, update inventories of bugs. And often it's a lot of fun. You do it as a group. Maybe pizza is there, and and um, you try to you try to find as many defects as possible. Hey, you know, for us as developers, it can be painful when bugs are found in our code, but this can make it fun, right? Um, it's like, oh, look, it broke. Oh man, um, I gotta fix that. It's 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 you know less likely to be taken uh, painfully and and personally if if you're if you're turning into a fun group activity. Um, uh, and you can develop new ideas for test cases, um, and then you can automate them, right? You can, you can, um, you can automate it. Um, so, other things I want you to encourage you: make sure if you're running late for your projects, make sure you don't skimp on tests. That's when testing is even more important. Do not, you know, go impress in a in a 18th century sense. Do not take the testers and turn them into helping out with development. Um, testing is most important when the project's under pressure. Why do I say that, Ardalan? Because you, you can actually make sure that the product that you are doing deliver for this thing actually works still. Good. That's right. And why would that be potentially a problem if the project's under pressure? Why would it be more vulnerable to problems? Because you, what you, are, you might be on very supposed stuff and make the future uh, kind of work in the file, but you actually want to file. Like the security yeah. issue is like yeah. actually not the feature or the whole program. Of the That's right. So so when when developers are in really a hurry, often they cut corners or they're not, they don't have time to think quite as much about their code, right? Um, maybe they're not producing as many unit tests as they normally would. Maybe they're not testing it as aggressively and thoroughly. Maybe they're not undertaking peer reviews as much because, and, and maybe those pull requests are not getting reviewed as much because we got to get it merged in with the branch. We don't have too much time. Let's, let's make an exception and only go with one person reviewing it. And, and that can be, uh, that can be a problem. Um, uh, some teams make make a, a hazardous assumption that obvious bugs have already been reported and that they're being worked on. Don't make that assumption. If you, if you see a failure in the system, don't assume that it's necessarily got an issue attached with it. Actually, 
do the work and, and check. Um, because it may be obvious, but it may be so obvious that people don't even mention it. You know, it's it's it, it doesn't have an issue created yet. Or maybe it's obvious for you, but not for other developers because of platform differences. Maybe you're on a Windows box or maybe you're on Linux and it's not occurring on on um you know the the Apple devices other people are using. Um you know, you um we'll talk quite a bit about good test cases, finding good test cases. Things for one variable at a time or for multiple variables at a time, same things like orthogonal arrays. Um, but uh, when you're testing, you want to test things that are like extreme cases and around those extreme cases, because often they are not being considered as much as a typical case, but they can often occur. Um, reproducible errors. What do I mean by a non-reproducible error? Yes, or no. So they're doing the right that they at one time, but then actually produce it. Yeah. Or it's yeah. I mean, I, I use the term non-reproducible, not in a strict sense that nobody ever in the history of the universe will be able to reproduce it, but it's a Heisen bug, right? It, it like sometimes occurs and sometimes doesn't. And you... You may only see it once. Be sure to, to report it because these are the ones where you need the longest lead time to find it often. And it might require the most probing to figure out what's causing it. Um, these things uh, may, they may be very reproducible under certain conditions, but it takes a while to find those. And the earlier you report it, the more likely you're going to be able to get others to report similar incidents. You'll start to notice commonalities. Oh, that this occurs pretty reproducibly when the web is kind of flaky or, you know, the, the, the internet connection is flaky or memory is low or, you know, it's got really a large amount of data that's being manipulated. And you start to put together the pieces that will let you track it down and re or reproduce it reliably and then track it down. Yes, or what? So for now, it means for the uh, one thing that I want to add is like computers to this oh. system crashes. They, yeah. they, they find out keep a lot of what's that happened under what condition. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And this is what crash analytics is too, right? Like when you use crash analytics or other similar tools, they will try to get a profile of what resources are in place. And ideally for these sort of things, how much memory is free, your disk space is free, et cetera, because it might be relevant for tracking it down, right? You might start to notice a pattern. And something like crash analytics or SIP tools of that ilk will allow you to, to sort of piece, piece together the data from many crashes and ask what commonalities are there. You know, which which can be really useful, right? You start to see evidence. Oh, this always occurs on Mac OS devices. You know, a, ver a certain version and before, and it's with less disk space or something like that. Um, disk space free. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now, I I do want to say. Um, Bug reports, there's a, you know, software projects have a human theater element to it. I don't mean that everyone's just performing in a, in a sort of drama sort of way. Um, what I mean is that, you know, um, showing, showing respect for others, um, interacting in a way that is, uh, that, that is empathetic for others um, it is important. And it actually helps the project and it can help avoid conflict. Um, you know, people feel stung sometimes when errors are discovered in their code. And it's important to not make it unnecessarily painful, right? Um, uh, and uh, here, um, you know, you wanna, when you, when you report a defect, you don't wanna, put too fine a point on it, you know, and 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 turn it into something that may lead to defensiveness. It's in everyone's interest to focus on the system and improving system quality, not on 
whose oversight led to this. It can be very useful to ask what process issues led to this. You know, what could we do better as a team in terms of training, in terms of building people's skill sets, in terms of how we test, in terms of the um, resources developers have access to, to make it less likely that a problem like this will happen again. But it shouldn't be about why does this person keep on making mistakes? Um, it should be about how can we all do better? And how can we improve system quality? And let's try to figure out how we can make this process work, you know, so that we can all do our best job. And if that means more training on the basics of the language you're using, maybe it's TypeScript, maybe it's, you know, basics on React, right? Um, uh, that can be a good investment, right? Um, uh, I've mentioned interfaces and separation of interface from implementation. You know it from the solid principles, the D. What does D stand for in solid? Anyone? Sorry? Dependency inversion, right? So the idea is that you don't count on a certain implementation of something. Rather, it's going, you're, you're counting on an interface. And that allows different particular implementations of this, right? Maybe some geared towards testing, like mock. Others that are, you know, initial implementations, lower performance, others that become higher performance over time, or lower memory footprint, whatever you're you're shooting for. Um right. Uh so testers, um when you have testing team, like your teams do, uh, one thing is if testers become familiar with different areas of the system, it could be good over time. So rotating them through, if, if someone's in a testing role, maybe right now they're testing the UI, maybe later they'll test the backend, the database side, maybe later they'll test the, um, the business logic. And that develops a certain familiarity with how the system hangs together that can be really really quite uh, quite useful. Um, uh, I will say that, um, you know, testing the same area of the system with multiple tests um, is not a waste, right? It, it, it can be useful to test the backend um, uh, in several different ways. It's not like only one test is needed. Um, but running the same test again and again and again in very quick succession, unless you're changing something relevant for it, is probably not the best uh, the best of time. Um, now, one other thing I want to urge you to think about is um, um, for some projects, they separate nominal fixing of defects, fixing of issues, marking an issue is fixed versus closing it out. Um, and and where certain parties like testers or end users are required to close it out, even though developers might say it's fixed. Why would you have that separation? Why not allow developers to just say it's gone, it's you know closed, no longer an issue? Why 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 testers, Eric? Um, again, like so, development might think it's fixed, but the person that made it yeah actually can test it to see if what they wanted is. That's right. And so maybe the a, a really good candidate here for the tester is the, the tester who found it in the first place, for example. Make sure it's fixed, right? Or maybe an end user who encountered the, the sort of someone who's um approaching it from the standpoint of uh, a user reported failure, which we hope don't occur. But if it does occur, you make sure with them it's fixed for them that you delivered value by fixing. Them. Why the, why might that be desirable? Why not just allow the developer to say it's done? Mm -hmm. Right along. Uh, two things that the team might be concerned about. One is that, well, you are telling that, hey, thank you for finding this one. Uh, and you know, telling them, hey, others come and crunch on you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember, well, you could say, like, just uh, close that we, we might just decide to delay that more. 
Well, yeah, yeah, and I and I don't want to impute um, laziness here, but when people are under pressure, it it is easy, particularly. So, look, let me make a broad statement. I want to make sure everyone's on the same page with it. Bugs, defects in the underlying system are often version specific. What do I mean by that? I don't mean they differ every single minor version change, they appear, disappear, but but broadly, they may only apply for certain versions and beyond, or you know, this version to that version, then they disappear. Why is that? Yes. Because the broad is done or you have a new feature that actually... you implement a new feature that maybe it rendered the new, old feature obsolete. You know, maybe this defect was there for the earlier version of the feature, but now it's it's been substantially upgraded code base and the problem disappeared, or maybe the problem got fixed, right? That could be, right? The problem's actually resolved. Um, and maybe the problem only got introduced in the first place when certain code got written or certain combinations of code got written. Maybe the code was working fine initially, but then an, another feature came in which changed the correctness of the assumptions in the original code and undercut its correctness. Could you imagine that happening? hope you can imagine that happening because it happens all the time. We write code with these assumptions in mind and we end up working fine for a while. And then another feature comes in and turns, you know, all files used to be read only and now they become, some become read write. And that code that we wrote that assumes it's read only files fails. This happens a lot. And it's one of the reasons that we put into our code, what folks, what do we put into our code early? What do we put into our code often that checks our assumptions? Assertions, like a Greek chorus. I love it, I love it. Um, uh, so, so here it's um, very important when we have code to be aware of you know, the versions in which um, a certain bug occurs. And to come back to this point about why would you have someone else close it, a developer could say, that was an old issue. Yeah, that used to happen. This, this defect used to be there. This failure, I'm sure it used to be there, but now I think I fixed it because I rolled out some related features and I'm going to mark it as closed because I can't make it appear now and it's probably just fixed because I, I changed those features. And so they're sympathetic, right, to themselves. <laughs> they, they think like, oh, I, I think I've resolved it. That, that was really old thing. And I know the code has changed a lot. And I can't, I can't reproduce this error right now. So I'll declare it closed. If they can do that, there's danger because they may not understand the error. They, they may not understand how it's changed after the recent changes, how it morphed. Um, they may not have even understood the bug report properly. If so, take it from an old man. Probably before you folks were born, I saw tons of this in commercial software development. You know, people people um read a report from a tester and and you know they give it a try as best they interpret it, and they can't reproduce it, so they say. Uh, it's it's probably just gone from the code base and and market as such. And it ain't gone from the code base. They didn't understand the test report. They didn't try it carefully enough. Maybe the test report didn't happen to mention that they needed this in the environment at the time, or the data used being manipulated had to be of such and such a type. And the developer tested it with you know their current configuration. Say I can't reproduce it, so it must be a mistake. It must be not a real, it, may no, it must no longer be applicable. Maybe it wasn't, it was just a mistaken report in the first place on some old machine. And and you you want for these reasons, the person who reports it ideally to, to, to a market is fixed. Does that make sense? Ardalan, speak, speak on. Also, technically what you're saying is like half the knowledge share doesn't happen. Sorry? Knowledge share happens in the like, report and the test. Like that. That's right. That's right. So, so knowledge share could spread across the team that this has been fixed. That's right, and genuinely fixed, right? Um, so, 
you know, often we have defects that are undiagnosed. I mean, almost all defects originally are undiagnosed. They start their life, right? Undiagnosed, not recognized, right? Generally speaking, we, we don't know they're there. And then often there's some testing that gives some sort of failure reports, right? I say bug reports, but what I actually mean is it's a report of some failure. The system didn't give the correct answer this time, or it crashed, or it hung, or you know, it 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 uh, acted weirdly, or it it just sort of became unusably slow, or whatever, right? And then there's a process. We're going to talk about it in a separate session called sanitization, which basically eliminates duplicates, eliminates outdated defect reports. It eliminates um, ones that are basically the same thing um, reported at, at different times and ones that are misunderstanding. That can't happen, right? Um, the test, the person who tests it may be thinking about an older version of the system and they didn't realize there was a change in requirements that changed what their expectation of what should happen. And they report as a defect, but it's really not. By the new updated requirements, it's, it's correct. These things that go through sanitization, no duplicates, et cetera, are active bugs. These are these are these are failures or you know system trouble incidents that need to be need to be investigated. And then there's a triage process associated with priority and considering some of the severity of bugs. Severity is sort of how bad it is if it happens, priority is balances how bad it is and probability of it happening. And then you assign it to developers. So the developers work on this and they believe at a certain point that it's fixed and uh, they'll mark it as, as fixed. And then the reporter fixing it may resolve it and potentially then there's another process where the test team says it's closed. Done, gone, right? Okay. Um, Defects. Uh, yes, yes, Erdogan. So you, you have some patch that works on HTFC and does anything. I didn't quite understand. Oh, back to this? Yeah, to this one. What? We're going to be talking about that probably next time. Why would it be? Why um, could it be that fixes by developers might, might somehow, somehow relate to new bugs? Yes, speak on intrepid because, because you're changing the fault still, and it might actually uh, have uh, unexpected uh, effects on other parts of the system as well. Just like yeah. Process, you might actually want to then bring it down. The other parts are also will be affected. Uh, but yeah, it's inspect uh, infection that you should remain. That, that, that's right. So, so this is the full horror revealed. This is the, the scandalous truth. Close the doors so the geologists don't know about it. <laughs> um, there's a high risk that bug fixes lead to new, lead to new what? You know where I'm going. Leads to new what? Bug. Say it like this. <laughs> new defects. Yes, we, we think we fix a defect and then we create a defect. Can you folks imagine that? Yes, you know. Have, has that ever, have, might you have ever seen it? Yeah. Might yeah. you have ever seen it late night in Sphinx mm. as you're trying to fix that 332 code? Oh, yes. <laughs> and is it possible uh -huh. that the fix doesn't fully fix it? Is it possible that it causes a new problem? Yes. And then you squeeze here on the balloon and it pops out there? Yes. Yep. The scandalous truth. <laughs> the scandalous truth, ladies and gentlemen. And the statistics on this are correct. If you're modifying code to fix a defect and you're modifying fewer than 10 statements or up to 10 statements, about 50% of bug fixes are successful in resolving the issue and not introducing new ones. They, they, you know, nip it in the bud, they get rid of the issue and they don't introduce a new one. 50% <laughs> do introduce, either do introduce new ones or don't work to really fix the issue. 
if you're modifying something like 50, uh, 50 statements of code, about 20% of bug fixes work in the sense that they eliminate the issue and cause no new problems. What is that saying about the fraction that don't work or that introduce new problems? What is that? It's 100% minus 20%, which last I checked is 80%. 80% fail to either solve the problem or they introduce a new problem. And there's many reasons for this, right? Problems with logical reasoning didn't lead to a, a, a correct uh, fix. Misunderstanding a bug report, right? Um, uh, they, they claimed that fix, but they didn't remember how to reproduce in the first place. So they wrote very specialized fixes that fix that particular manifestation but caused another problem, maybe even a worse problem. And guess what? That leads to this feedback back to new bugs often. And why, why could that be so problematic that new bugs are created at this point when you think you're fixing bugs? Ardalan, you've you've had your time in the limelight, so I'm gonna uh, ask Jesse back there. That's right. And when will these be discovered? Upon being created? When might they be discovered? Well, yeah, once they go through testing and come into here, and then they go through sanitization and come here, and then get triaged and, and get identified as, as really significant bugs to be fixed. This whole process might take weeks, right? So you may think you're solving it, but you're creating, you solve the devil that you know, and you create what, folks? Uh, you know. Yes, new defects, the devil you don't know, right? Um, and that devil has fangs. Um, and you won't discover that for a long time. Yes, Ardwan. Can you solve that with test automation? So that yes, test yes. Automation. Test automation can hopefully test these things. So if you have good coverage of your test automation, I see many of you striving for that. If you have really rigorous testing going on, it can be great in speeding you down here. But it may not be perfect because maybe you fixed it um, in an area that's under tested, right? Um, maybe there's no test for that area right now. Maybe it's a new area of the program you've rolled out and tests haven't been written. You could see why testing is so important, right? In fact, it's so important. We're going to have a pop quiz on it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, last little bit of time here. Um, I was really excited about it. I'm going to try to help you. I'm
Put your names on it. Anyone not get it? Okay, uh, once you finish, you're welcome to leave, even if you wish, storm out the room. <laughs> 